And amen. And uh, at this time, I, I think I'm up, right? <laughs> amen. Uh, for those who, who don't know me, who were not able to be here last week, my name is Jim. And you can just call me Jim or whatever you feel ca- comfortable with. If it's Brother Jim, Pastor Jim, that, that's fine too. But basically, you just call me Jim. I'm just in partnership with you here at Fern Creek in this community that we live in and uh, Louisville, uh, Kentucky as well, that we're here just to serve Jesus Christ and to worship Him. Last week, I got to introduce my family, and so pray for my wife who is in tears because she took my daughter back to the airport Saturday morning, and and she flew back to Pennsylvania where she lived. And uh, so she's not here today. My son's not able to be here. His uh, his uh, girlfriend's family lives in Nashville, and he's down there with that family uh, for the f- fourth weekend. And then my wife, really pray for my wife. Nine o'clock last night, something very unusual happened. She got called to go into work, <laughs> two hours away, by the way, and she's still down there at work. So she works in the hospital there in Clinton County. But she wanted everybody to know this, okay? I know we're, everybody's to bring two dishes, right? I think today we had, we went and got the food. It's still there. I'm not a cook. So, but, uh, she said, make sure they knew we were going to bring something, uh, too. And, and we're looking forward to that fellowship time as well. We're looking forward to that time to be together. Well, last week in the first service, after I really opened a can of worms, I felt like I should have probably preached on a passage that says there is neither Jew nor Greek, you know, uh, uh, slave or free, male or female, you know, cats fan or cards fan, <laughs> because we're because we're all one in Jesus Christ. And that's really where I want to go. We're all one in Jesus Christ. Amen. And by the way, and he loves us all. That's one thing I'm sure of. So he loves us all. And it's about the unified body of Jesus Christ. Today, I'm going to begin actually a three-part series um, over the next four weeks now with the youth doing their thing from Luke 15. Luke 15 is absolutely one of my favorite chapters of the Bible because the first two verses of Luke 15 are actually my life verses. And you're going to get to hear a bit of my story uh, here in a little bit today, just so you'll know more about me and where I, I come from and what Christ has done in my life as well. Uh, how many of you have life verses, by the way? You know, just some verse that really sticks out to you. And I see several hands going up as well. You guys got life verses. Well, Luke 15, 1 and 2, you'll hear a story of why these are my life verses. But I'm going to read through the first 10 verses, which actually covers two of the three parables about lostness that Jesus will talk about. And then over the next few weeks, I'll talk about one we know uh, well, the prodigal son or the parable of the loving father and And then the week after that, we'll talk about that older brother who was back at home and who was not enjoying the presence of his father or God at all because of a problem he had in his life. And we'll look at that also. But for today, Luke 15, 1 through 10, you can hear the word. And if it's different, I'm not sure if it's going to roll on the screen now, but if it does, I I believe it'll be about the same. I use the old NIV version. Hear Hear the word of God. Now the tax collectors and sinners, and in the NIV, it puts the little quotes around sinners because that means something special in this passage. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Him, and that's Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And they were muttering. I got a feeling they muttered a whole lot of other things too at that point. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable because what Jesus wanted to do in response to that muttering, He wanted to say, hey, let me tell you what the kingdom's like. So He told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country? Don't miss that. You can underline those two words. And go after the lost sheep until he finds it. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends together and says, Rejoice with me. Second time we see rejoice. I have found my lost sheep. 
I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing, third time, in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent. And then the second parable. Or suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank You for Your Word. For Your Word is truth. And today I thank You for the words of Jesus Christ that He shared not only with a group of people who were probably hungry and starving and longing to be loved, but He also shared with a group of folks who it was more about religion and making sure you did this or that than it was about grace and mercy and love. And Jesus, I know that You spoke that not only nearly 2,000 years ago, but through Your Spirit, You speak it again this morning. And we pray that You will give us ears to hear and hearts to receive this message. And may it continue to change us. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. As I said, these were my life verses, verses 1 and 2, especially the fact that Jesus welcomed and He ate with sinners. And the reason it's my life first is because I got to see literally the incarnation of Jesus Christ working through someone that did that for my life. And you're going to get to hear more about that in the second part of the sermon today, but we're going to begin the first part looking at a few of the principles. We're going to see three principles that come from this uh, powerful Scripture. Uh, first of all, you'll notice in this passage that before we get to Jesus is crazy in love with you, I want to just point out something else as well, but you can leave that up there right now at this time. But the first thing I want to point out to you today is the, this fact, that you'll see that the people who gathered around Jesus Christ, and, and what was it about Jesus? What was it about His Spirit? What was it about His unconditional love? What was it about Jesus that could look to a sinner person and they were drawn to Jesus Christ? And so it's all those folks who are surrounding Jesus. But here's the key thing that this passage talks about. It talks about that there were tax collectors and sinners gathering around Him. Now, the reason it quotes sinners is because in that day and time, in the religious person's understanding of sinner in first century uh, time of Jesus Christ and the Jewish people, they had a long list of what a sinner was. Number one, by the way, as I say these, see if you kind of fit in there somewhere. I know I do. Number one... All Gentiles were sinners, okay? That got me. Did it get anybody else? Okay, it got me right off the bat. Number two, if you worked for a Gentile, you were a sinner. Remember parable number three? The prodigal son, he's going to work for, you got it, a Gentile. So he's going to be a big sinner as well. Number three, all outcasts were sinners. And that was pretty... Pretty obvious. Number four, this is a difficult one. They considered anybody who was sick to be a sinner and they made the sinner list. Now that's because their theology of sickness was really messed up. Because the Jewish people of the first century and the leaders that taught people thought if you were sick, there was a reason you were sick and it was called sin. And it was either you sinned or your parents sinned or somebody sinned. And then in John 9, the man who was born blind, if you remember that story, his disciples asked him, okay, this guy's been blind since birth. Who sinned? Who sinned? Jesus, was it he or his parents? And Jesus' answer totally blows away that theology when he says, neither this man nor his parents sinned. But this was done that the glory of God might be revealed to all. That God's glory might be revealed. So they were kind of messed up. But I'm telling you, when they pigeonhole people in sin... Okay, if you were sick, you were in that list. One, one you know well, all Samaritans, right? They were, they were big time on the center list. And this one we might understand a little bit more. Harlots, prostitutes made the center list. Number seven is really interesting. All unclean Jews made the center list. And there were a lot of ways you became unclean. In fact, if you touched the dead body of 
someone, you became unclean. If you touched a leper, you became unclean. If you touched someone sick, you became unclean. And you were listed, at least in their listing, as sinner. By the way, does anybody know who touched all those folks? Yeah, his name's Jesus. Jesus made the list. He made their list. Now, we know He was perfect and sinless. Don't you go home and say, the pastor said Jesus sinned. I'm not saying that at all. Actually, but He made their list. He was perfect and sinless. And you know what? That's part of the fact that shows us that Jesus Christ is crazy in love with you and He's crazy in love with me. It was crazy in some sense of the word that Jesus Christ would leave the regalness of heaven, it's called the incarnation, and He would come and tabernacle or put His tent, that's the King James word, is that He would put His tent right in the midst of our tents, guys. And, and the picture of that is this, man, we were in darkness, so if you can imagine camping and the worst storm like hit, when was that storm hit? Friday night or Saturday man, right? Like crazy. And, and it was so muddy. And it, this is the picture of what John 1's talking about. Jim, here's your tent. Here's Daryl's tent. Here's the congregation's tent. Man, we are just in mud, in dirt, covered, sin. Jesus Christ willing to leave heaven to get Himself dirty. Jesus was not afraid to get Himself dirty. He was not afraid to reach out to someone who needed His healing touch. In Mark chapter 2, in fact, the first person He heals is the leper. No one touched leper. Jesus is that crazy in love with us. Now, I call them the religion police. Say that word with me. Religion police. Pharisees, Sadducees, <laughs> teachers of the law in that day and time. They mutter. Now, I know there's no church, no Methodist church in Kentucky where people mutter, right? I mean, they, 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 okay. That was supposed to be a joke, by the way. Um, okay, might be some muttering going on. I'm not sure. But anyway, but they would mutter. You can see them over there. They're like this. I see the Pharisees like this. The people who are in need of Jesus, they're like this. We just need you. And, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees were like this, and their mother, can you believe that kind of woman? We see that in another passage. That kind of woman, that Jesus would let her touch him. You know, and that, that's what we see. And, but what they say, this man, Jesus welcomes sinners and eats with them. They meant it to, to, uh, put him down, but you know what? It was exactly what Jesus came to do. This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. By the way, church, I think that would be a ch good church slogan. This church welcomes sinners and eats with them. I don't know if we have to dig and pray and have all these wild kind of ideas. Okay, what can be the church slogan or purpose statement? This is a pretty good one. This church welcomes sinners and eats with them. And, and Jesus, as Jesus would always do, when, when He was kind of indignant over something people said, like the religious institution, He would always try to tell them, let me tell you what my Father really is like. I know you claim you know my Father. He would say, but let me tell you what my Father's really like. In fact, let me tell you what I'm like. Let me tell you what the kingdom's like. And all of the parables are lessons and pictures, snapshot of what God's kingdom is like. One of my favorites is this first one. Jesus is a love one. I want you to read. I think we've got the verses coming up here. Just one verse I want to point out. In the first of the parable, it's the shepherd and the sheep. And then it says this word, Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses just one of them. Think about that. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the okay corral? No. They're not safe back at home. They're not safe. He leaves 99 together, and that's a good part of it, but they are not in the OK Corral. He leaves them out in the open country. And you know what that means? In the open country, the same predators who are after that one who is lost could be after them as well. And we're kind of thinking, well, well Jesus said 99 enough. I mean, you got 99 here. Why don't you protect these? But he's got this idea that the body helps to protect each other. And so there's the 99. But Jesus is desperate for the one that is absolutely lost. You know, how many of you, young people here today, how many of you would be really excited to make 99 out of 100 on the test? Right, uh, there you go. Oh, oh, I see where the youth are now. 90, hey, that's pretty good. We'd say, okay, I'm not going to worry about that one point. 99 out of 100 is not enough for Jesus. He's got to find that one and he 
It's desperate looking and it tells us, Peter tells us in 2 Peter 3.18, He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. He doesn't just say, okay, I hope most don't perish. He says, I don't want to lose a single one. I don't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So I'm willing to leave the 99 that are safe right here together to go find that one desperate. And I say, well, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> well, it's not crazy. It's just how much Jesus is crazy in love with you. Three years ago, I got a chance to go to the Holy Land. And uh, it was a wonderful trip. I think I told you last week, if you ever get a chance to go to the Holy Land, go. It will bring the Bible to life. But when we were due to fly back in, a foot of snow hit New York City the day we flew in at JFK. And they shut down every single flight. So you know how bad it was. Because they were snowed in in Chicago. They were snowed in in Detroit. Charlotte, North Carolina, of all places, got eight inches of snow that day. And we were just completely shut in. And um, and I remember us, and they shut down everything. And the people at the counter said, hey, it might be tomorrow night before you get a flight. It might be two days before you get a And we're all going, oh my goodness, we're going to have to spend the night here a couple of days in the airport. So we're calling family. And that word got around to the church folks back at Russell Springs, and there's a young man by the name of Mark Coots. He's one of the bus drivers. We have a bus similar to the one you got there. or the, They have a bus back there. And, and Mark Coots calls me. I answer my cell phone. JFK, we're trying to figure out what to do. Do we get a van? Do we? What are we going to do? And it's Mark Coots. And he said, Jim, you give me the word, I'll be there in 12 hours with the church bus. <laughs> and my exact words was, Mark, that's crazy. There's a foot of snow on the ground. There's a blizzard. But I realize that's how crazy in love Mark was with us. He was willing to do that. In fact, he didn't stop there because what we decided to do, well, we rented a van to get out. We went to Morgantown, West Virginia, the only time I've been to Morgantown. And uh, he said, we'll meet you in Morgantown six hours both ways. He and two other men from the church got on that bus sometime in the wee hours of the morning. And there was no better sight for our group that we were so tired and worn out than to see that bus sitting at the Morgantown, West Virginia airport. Well, somebody just give a hand to the Lord for that because that's what... <laughs> That's someone who knows the crazy love of Jesus Christ and is in crazy in love for Him for other people as well. And so Jesus finds that lost one and He comes home and there's all kinds of rejoicing and it calls everybody together to rejoice. Now the second parable tells us how invaluable we are to Jesus Christ. And invaluable is, we might, you know, the commercials they say priceless. You know, you do all these things and it costs this much money, this much, but it's priceless. That means you can't put up a price on it. It is invaluable. And that's what we are to Jesus. And the second parable tells us that. Or suppose a woman. Isn't that interesting? Jesus is telling about the kingdom of God, what it's like, and He uses a woman as an example. So all the women of the church said what? Amen, right? And by the way, there's times when he's weeping over Jerusalem. I mean, Jesus is weeping for the lostness of Jerusalem. And, and he says, oh, how I wish I was like a, the mother hen that can gather her chicks underneath her. And he said, I, I love them and want them to be with me close to the heart and, and all of that. But that's not the main part of this, but I just want to throw that in for you ladies. Okay, I need a few brownie points after last week. But our supposed woman has been has ten silver coins and loses one. Now, you know, somebody in the Sunday school today was talking about how we don't value much anymore. You, you know, you lose something, oh, big deal, I'll go out and buy something else or something break, we'll go buy something else. We're that kind of society. If I sit down on the couch at the parsonage and some silver coins <laughs> fall out of my my uh, pocket, I'm probably not getting up from my nap to get them, <laughs> you know. I mean, I might later, if we clean deeply, I might do that, but I'm not then. So what's this ten silver coins? And why was this so valuable to that lady? Well, the ten silver coins actually, back in that time, back to Dr. Jim Fleming, biblical archaeologist from Hebrew University in Jerusalem, told us some of this background of this, that in that day and time of the first century, the ladies who were engaged, so to say, we would use the word engaged, they would wear ten silver coins around their forehead, and it was, it was this to them. And this ring, this ring shows my love to my wife, Sheila. It's a covenant between us and God that He would be the head of that. And I want you to know, Daryl, if I lose this, I'm looking for it, okay? If it falls, I'm, I'm going to dig and look. And so she only lost one, and it was so much to her that she's going to search furiously. Well, why? Because when her husband got home, 
If she's just missing one of those ten coins, you know what he could accuse her of? Giving it away to another man. He could accuse her of adultery or stepping out of that relationship. By the way, number six on the list were the harlots and the prostitutes who Jesus was not afraid to touch because they were just as valuable as anybody else in the, in the picture of Jesus Christ. And guys, I want you to know you're invaluable to Jesus. And He means that for each one. And here's another powerful thing. God will stop at nothing to find you and me. He will stop at nothing. I, I love the, the woman. It says she searches her entire house and, and, and she's examining it. And I, in my mind, I want to see her moving all the furniture. You know, um, when, when we clean house or somebody comes into your clean house, most people clean what? <laughs> the open space, right? I mean, just the, the part of the carpet you can see. After 17 years of being at Russell Springs, we started moving stuff, and I went, oh my goodness, <laughs> there was so much dust and something. I went, gosh, we had, we didn't move that to clean. But I am convinced this woman moved every stick of furniture because she had to find that lost coin. It was so valuable to her. She couldn't let it be lost for her husband to come home. It represented covenant. It represented relationship. It represented all of those things. And so she lights a lamp, and that's a beautiful image. She lights a lamp to look into the dark places. And we know Jesus is the light of the world. He's come to look into the dark places of our lives as well to find us. Now guys, the second part, I'm going to share a little bit of my testimony. And you'll discover that uh, God looks for us in a lot of different ways. Man, God looks for us through circumstances. God looks for us truthfully through His Word, right? He looks for us through prayer and when people intercede for people like we intercede here. Man, that's God looking through His Holy Spirit. But God also looks for us through people. How many of you know that to be true? That there was somebody or, or several people or, or as contagious Christian I know y'all study says, you know, there were a lot of somebodies down the trail that were reaching out to you when you were lost. And that was true in my life. So I want to share a little bit of my, uh, really it's my prevenient grace story. Uh, we'll throw in the theological word. Y'all are Emmaus folks, prevenient grace. That's the grace of God that comes pursuing you and me long before I even knew the name of God. <laughs> that God was pursuing me. He was pursuing you. And He's longing to win you to Him. Now, I, I was kidding with someone yesterday. I'm really not kidding. As I share a bit of my testimony, I'm going to give you the PG version, okay? <laughs> or it might be kind of the GPG. Uh, if you go to the prison with me or to Emmaus, you might hear a little bit more. But I'll just kind of give you the generalities of it as well. But I discovered a God who was looking for me a long time. Actually, before I was born. By conception. I grew up in Pensacola, Florida, as y'all know. I grew up at a church called Gadsden Street United Methodist Church. And in the 60s, it was of an old church. The church was built in the 1800s, man. Old, you know, gothic kind of style church. Very formal church, very traditional at the time. And, and it was a, it was a good church. I was in that church for several years. I was baptized as an infant at the church because my parents would show us pictures of that. And I want to tell you, my mom and dad loved the Lord. And two or three weeks into my life, when they held me at that altar, and they made a commitment to raise me in the name of Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, my parents stuck to that commitment. Um, yeah, I kind of kid, some people say they had a drug problem. Well, we, my brother and sister and I, we had a drug problem. We were drugged to church, you know, every, every, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night, every Wednesday. I mean, we were there, and my mom and dad served in the church 24-7 almost, but they took us to church, and I want to tell you, they did their part. I remember Prevenient Grace was Mrs. Lily Roberts, who is the closest thing that looks like Mother Teresa, a lady that stood about this high. She was about, she was in her late 80s when I was a little boy. We'd climb up the stairs of the elementary building and Mrs. Roberts would stand there. You could not get around her. She would stand right at the top of the stairway smiling and, and she would say, and she called me Jimmy. She would say, Jimmy, God loves you and so do I. And she would give you a big hug. Now, as a five or six year old, sometimes we didn't want to hug, you know, but, but there was no way to get around Miss Roberts, you know, she would, she would dance in front of you. But I look back now and see Prevenient Grace. I, I, I say I went through confirmation class when I was probably about 12. I don't remember much about the class. I do know this. I did not open my heart to make a personal profession of faith 
But what I do remember doing was I am not going to refute Pastor Smith when he said Jesus died on the cross. Okay, I'm, I fared he knew. But as I turned 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, sin life starting to go rampant, I know I was lost because I had absolutely no relationship with Jesus Christ. I did not read the Bible ever, unless in a class, I want to tell you to open it, I did not pray. I was doing nothing that shows a relationship with Jesus Christ. And guys, from the age of 16 to 22, there were a group of us and we all grew up in that church and we all were in two or three years of each other, guys and girls. And from about my age of 16 to 22, we got ourselves into more trouble than anybody outside of the church could have gotten us into. I mean, we were our own worst enemies. We were leading each other into sin. And, and I'll just put it this way. We were sending it up during the week. And we would come in on Sunday mornings and there was two rows of kids that were young people, teens, older teens, into college, sitting in the back two rows of Gaston Street United Methodist Church. And sometimes we had sinned so much, guys. I love to fish off the Pensacola Bay Bridge and uh, off, if some of you have been down in that area. And sometimes we had sinned so much, we would take our fishing glasses, those wrap around, and we would wear them to church because we, we didn't want anybody to know. And you know, a lot of people might have said, you guys are the biggest hypocrites that I know, except there was one problem. We weren't hypocrites. We were lost. And as my former uh, associate pastor often said, lost people act like lost people. Because there's something called the sin nature that drives you and we were being driven. And we can't expect someone who's lost a man like they're doing everything right. Because lost people act like lost people. And so here's two rows of lost young people. And the, the prevenient grace of God was this. When I was uh, 21 years of age, um, Pam Waldorf, who was the youth leader, she came to me and she said, Jim, we got two loads of young people that need to go to a camp, kind of like what you guys did. And I need another 21 year old to drive the other van. So she asked this lost guy to drive. Well, I want to tell you something. I, I went to the camp with those young people and I enjoyed doing the work. We did work on homes, Daryl, and things like that. And I enjoyed it. And I'll never forget Friday night because on that Friday night, they said it was commitment time. And the guy's up there and he's singing music and someone begins to share about Jesus Christ. And they said, hey, we're going to give each one of you that's here today, we're going to give you a class. And one's going to be a fish hook. And then you've got the little class. And and today, if you know Jesus Christ, when we're through with the service, you go ahead and put it on your hat, clasp it on there, put it on your shirt, clasp it on there. Or tonight, if you come to know Jesus Christ, you go ahead and do that too. But if you don't, and you want to think about it more, and you want to pray about it, you take that fish hook in this hand, and you take the class in that hand, and you just go and take it back. And you start praying. And that's what I did that evening. That went in my suitcase, unclassed. And it would be unclassed for over a year. Fortunately for me, God kept looking for me. And when I was 21 or 22, God introduced me to a new associate pastor who came to our church. And his name is Jeff Spicer. And to this day, I pray for Jeff and thank God for him every day. Because Jeff Spicer came as the associate pastor. He did a lot of the role, Daryl, you're doing. And he was up front. The pastor would preach. And he would... And, and, and you know what? Jeff knew something. He looked back on those two, last two rows of Gadsden Street. And you know what? In his discernment, didn't take a lot of discernment, but he saw two rows of lost kids, young people. And we didn't know this till later, but I made his top ten most wanted list. Uh, anybody know what that is? That's called the prayer list. <laughs> In our names, many of us on those back two rows were on Jeff's list. Uh, Jeff was like no other pastor we'd ever met. He, he said, hey guys, you want to go out to eat? Let's go to a movie. Hung out. We thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I never had a, I never hung out with a pastor. And we started hanging out our IE, Jesus Eats with Sinners. And Jeff started doing that. Fast forward real quick. I know time is upon us. And, and they gave me a small cup of water back here, Tom. So, uh, that's a little joke between Tom and I, but hang in there. 
But uh, 1984, January, Jeff Spicelin, this guy who had just loved us and loved us and did all kinds of stuff with, uh, he says, Jim, the church, the youth, young adult, they're going to go to Jamaica, West Indies for a mission trip. We're going to paint a school. I'd love for you to go. And I said, no. <laughs> he asked me another week. And I said, no. <laughs> he asked me a third and a fourth and a fifth and a sixth time. And I said, no. Every Sunday, Jeff kept asking me, why don't you go on this trip? Why don't you go? Well, here's the problem. It was my senior year at the University of West Florida. I was graduating. I had two weeks off. One was for finals. I worked 35 weeks at, at Sunbeam Bakery as a business at night. Went to school during the day. And I thought, man, I gotta have a week off to study for finals. And number two was to celebrate study, you know, after finals. You'll kind of get the picture. G version there, PG. But that's exactly what I'd planned. Jeff asked me so many times to go. If I saw him at church, I would go another way. So to, to, so he wouldn't keep bugging me. May comes. May goes. <laughs> vacation comes. Vacation goes. It's June, early June. They're going late June on this trip. It's early June. Here's the prevenient grace of God and the God that looks for me and you as well. I was, they had called up and said, Hey, Jim, there's some stores that need servicing out in Guffrey's, Florida. Can you go do that? And I said, Sure. And I was heading that way. It was about lunchtime. And to get to Guff Breeze, I always went down Ninth Avenue. Gatson Street is on Gatson Street and Ninth Avenue. And I'm driving right by the church at lunchtime. And I decided, hey, I wonder if Jeff would like to go to lunch real quick. And so I stop in the church. I knock on his pastor's door. And when he opens it, here he is. He's on the phone to Eastern Airlines ordering the tickets for Jamaica. And he goes like this, Jim, I'm ordering the tickets for Jamaica. Please let me order you one. And I said, I can't go. I don't have any vacation time. There's nothing left. I can't go. He goes, please, please, I beg you. And I said, I can't go. And then finally he said, I'll tell you what. I, he was so persistent. I said, I'll tell you what. Here's what I'll do, Jeff. I'll at, After I work today, I'll go back and I'll ask if that, no, before he, before I said that, he said, Jim, I tell you what, I want you to go so bad, I'll go back to work with you and ask off for you. If, and I thought, that is embarrassing, Jeff. You are not doing that. And, and he said, I said, I'll tell you what I'll do, Jeff, I will, as soon as work's over, I'll go ask. They will say, no, <laughs> I will call you up. And he said, Jim, as long as you promise to do that. And I said, okay, I'll promise. I'll do that. I got back. Now, when I'm driving around that damn thinking, hold it, I can go to Jamaica for 10 days. They had done so much fundraising. Guess how much I could go for? $25. <laughs> 10 days, Jamaica. I thought, that sounds kind of good. <laughs> and I thought, I think I will ask. So I get back to my immediate supervisor, Mr. George. I said, George, I got this great opportunity. I can go to Jamaica for 10 days for $25. And he thought, well, that sounds good. And then he said, well, what's it for? And I kid you not, I went, it's for a church mission trip. And he said, it's for what? I said, a church mission trip. <laughs> he said, oh man, that sounds real good. But I can't give the authority to do that, but go talk to the vice president, Mr. Bill White. Yes sir, no sir to me kind of guy. I didn't know him well. And he can give you off. So I do the same routine. I said, Mr. White, I've got, I go to Jamaica 10 days, $25. And, uh, and he said, well, that sounds good. What's it for? And I said, a mission trip. And, uh, and he went, a mission trip. Do you know Mrs. J.B. White? And I said, yeah, she goes to my church. She's my next door neighbor. 300,000 people in Escambia County. She's my next door neighbor. And for the last three months when we're in our backyard working in our yards, and we meet at the fence. All she can talk about is this mission trip your church is going on. Not only can you go, we'll pay your time off. Now, today I would call that a glory sighting. Back then, <laughs> back then I just went, yes. You know, I mean, yeah, I didn't, I didn't know amen. And I was as lost as lost. Here, here's the real picture of this. Um, fast forwarding. The Wednesday night before, 28 of us, young adults and a, and a few older youth and some adults are going to go to Jamaica. The Wednesday night, the church throws a fellowship meal and they want to pray for us as a team. Now, I want to guarantee you, there's six, seven lost young people going on this trip. They had this banner like you see at football homecomings and it was long and it was on the wall. It said, Boyne Voyage, Jamaica Bound. 
And we saw that and it was nice. We had the meal. They prayed for us and then a couple of my buddies, about four or five of us got together. And we thought, hey, Friday night, why don't we have our own kind of party? <laughs> it was not a church fellowship party. I would just say that much. And we asked Jeff, what are you going to do with that banner? And he said, oh, nothing. We're going to throw it away. Can we have it? And he said, sure, you can have it. And he didn't know what we... He would not have given it to us if, if he had known what was... So we go back to my house. I live with my brother. He's a tugboat captain. He's gone all the time. So basically my house. And we went back and we put that that up around like three walls in my living room. <laughs> Boy, by y'all, Jamaica bow. We went to Albertson's food store for stuff. And, and guess who we ran into at Albertson's Friday afternoon? We ran into Jeff Spicer. Um, now, some people get saved from being, you know, addicted to different things. I got saved from being an idiot, okay? Um, we see Jeff, and he said, guys, what are you doing? I said, Jeff, we're going to have a party at my house tonight. Why don't you come? <laughs> <laughs> my friend behind him was going, you idiot. I'm just telling him, you idiot. What are... And so he leaves and goes, Jim, what are you doing? He, and I said, guys, no pastor would come to my house. On a Friday night, that night, party, 10.30, I heard three things in succession. Ah! Slam of door. <laughs> and my good friend Dave Morris ran back to the kitchen where I was at the time. I said, Dave, what's wrong? The preacher showed up. <laughs> and he slammed the door in his face. <laughs> and I said, well, let him in. <laughs> and Jeff came in. And Jeff did... I said he he it does a, he did a Jesus question on us. You know, Jesus knows all the answers before he asked, but he said, guys, what are y'all doing? And uh, he knew. But this was about Jeff. He didn't take this Bible. He didn't thump me over the head. He didn't say, you guys, y'all are disqualified from the trip. He didn't call the senior pastor, at least not at my house. He might have later. But I know he prayed for us. And he did something very special. He took a Coca-Cola and he sat down with us for over an hour. And I'll never forget his words. Close to midnight, he walked to the door and he looked back at us and he said, I'll see you on the plane Sunday morning, 36 hours later. And that group of lost young people got on that plane and we landed in Kingston, Jamaica. I don't know if you've ever been there, but it's a rough place. And there's a lot of poverty. And I'm convinced to this day that as we were driving on a tour bus, by the way, they put us on one of those nice tour buses the Jamaicans all piled in on just kind of dilapidated school buses. And, and I felt, I was feeling some weird stuff about double standards, the way we were being treated. And I, I look back now and realize the Holy Spirit had begun to work in my heart. But we were driving through, I've seen some poverty, but nothing like this in Kingston. It was just every, everywhere. And I'm convinced the Holy Spirit brought us to a traffic light and turned that light red. Because at that lit red light, about eight or nine Jamaican children came running out of this house and they had fruit, and they had dates, and they had nuts. And they lined up one in front of each window, and I know they saw Americans, they got money, and they need money. And this little Jamaican girl, eight or nine years old, lined up in front of my window, and I can see her today. And she lifted up her hands like this. And it was almost as if she was begging me to help her. And I want to tell you, the Holy Spirit pierced my heart. In that moment, I, I wanted, if I could have given her every dime I had, I would have, but the windows couldn't come down. And all I could do was look in her eyes. And in that moment, some people need an altar. I had a back of a bus seat. And the Holy Spirit pierced my heart to my self-centeredness. And, and I was, me and guys, I was dwelling on that and how selfish I was and living for myself. And all those things began just in my life. That bus made it to Mofford. I say, you know, Paul got converted on the road to Damascus. Mine was on the road to Mofredi, the little church we were going to, the little school we were helping paint. And, and as we painted that school, the Spirit continued to shape and form me. And that Sunday morning, I'll never forget, Jeff Spicer, God looking for me. Isn't that something? God will go to a foreign country to look for you. How about that? And Jeff Spicer, it was, you know, British Columbia, you know, it's a British influence. So they had this spiral staircase. I'll never forget Jeff. I had to go up the spiral so He's looking down on us to preach. And I was like, I do not remember a word he preached about. All I, all I remember was I wish he would be quiet so I could come to the altar. And uh, y'all, some of y'all might be thinking the same thing. But uh, that would be great if he'd come to the altar. And when he gave the altar call, I ran for the mercy seat. I literally went. And I ran. And right behind me was one of my buddies, Alan McBride and Dawn Stewart and several Jamaicans. And probably about 15 of us got saved that day. 
And I accepted Jesus in my heart and Lord and Savior. I've never been the same since. <laughs> and I met this God who's crazy in love with me and, and told me I'm invaluable and, and is not going to stop at anything to find me. Because He found me and I know it's the same God who, who can find you as well. Um, Alan McBride who came, he's pastor of Orange Beach United Methodist Church now. <laughs> Don Stewart's a youth pastor. And God got a hold of a group of sinners. And we went back home and we formed our own Bible, our own Bible study. We just got the word out and just started reading it. <laughs> we didn't know anything else to do. And God started working that group of young people. And not long after that, I answered the call to ministry. And 31 years into it, I still love Jesus Christ. Even more today than I ever have before. And I know it's the same God who's looking for you. I know we're entering into the time of Holy Communion, but I want to tell you, if you need to come to this altar and accept Christ, you can do that. I mean, we'll kind of break mold. Um, or afterwards when we sing the invitation. I want to encourage you to come because Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He's crazy in love with you. And He's been looking for you. And if you don't know if you've heard today, He's kind of found you if you open up your heart and receive Him as your Lord and Savior. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen.